I don't think I remember my first visit to a museum, but I, but I do remember coming to London when I was, um, I guess probably eight or nine or ten, and we would come between Christmas and New Year each year, and we would, my parents would exchange uh, a, a, a flat with some, some friends of theirs who lived in uh, Bloomsbury, and we would go to the British Museum, and my father would make a kind of adventure trail each Christmas, um, we would, my sister and I would then run around the British Museum looking for things that he'd written down. So he would write down, uh, you know, an amphora with um, Zeus on it or a Viking sword. So these were not even things that he knew existed, but then, we would, then the two of us would kind of run around trying to find the things. I came to the Tate as a, as a child on a school trip. So at that point it was then the Tate Gallery, which is now Tate Britain. And, and so I, rem I, I very much remember I can very clearly remember as it was then and the different rooms in the gallery and what, and what was in them. So it must have made a little impression on me. I think, I think I got a sense, you know, when I came as a child that this was a special kind of place that was different from, you know, it was different from a library and it was, and it was different from a church and it was different from a school or a university and these were the kind of the other places that I knew as a child or a shop. And, uh, and so I guess it always had a kind of intriguing quality. I think, as a, I mean, as a very small child, I think I wanted to be a train driver, uh, which is not unusual. And I remember having an interest in archaeology, which I guess came from thinking about, well, among other things, thinking about the British Museum and where did these things come from, and just sort of trying to understand other cultures through the artefacts that were, you know, left behind. And so then, between the ages of sort of sixteen and eighteen. I studied, which is normally the age at which people spe uh, specialise in, you know, in humanities or in, in science or in um, mathematics or, or whatever. I, I was a sort of generalist, so I did three courses that were English literature, um, pure mathematics and politics. So I <laughs> essentially did a science, a humanities and a social science, so one of everything which was very, I mean, very unusual. And then I went to university, and in fact I did, I did go to study art history um, in the first instance, and in the first year there was a multidisciplinary approach uh, which sort of focused on the Enlightenment, and students were in a kind of... Uh, I was going to say encouraged, but actually required to do a number of sort of units outside of their core subject area. And I did one in philosophy, which I really enjoyed. And at the end of the um, at the end of the first well, at the end of that first year, the philosophy department said to me, you know, if you want to switch to do philosophy, we'd love to have you in our, in our department. Uh, and and I did that. Which was pretty good because if I'd actually applied to that department, I wouldn't have gone in with the grades I had before. <laughs> so it's kind of lucky. And so I studied that up to your yeah, bachelor degree level. It's a kind of icy economic climate for philosophers. So I mean, it leads to academia. Um, so there was definitely a period after I graduated where I mean, I did all kinds of things. I worked, I worked in a library for a while, a university library, and. I did an internship at the Institute of Contemporary Arts here in London in their exhibition um, uh, uh, department. After the library and the internship, I got a job at a publishing company and I worked there for six years in various editorial roles. And which, I mean, which I really enjoyed and then Towards the, towards the end of that period, I became, I started to do more and more, publishing work is really badly paid. And so outside of work, I was then doing kind of more and more work for initially friends and, and friends of friends, kind of doing desktop publishing and doing, uh, and, then, and then I started doing websites. So essentially doing in the kind of early days of digital publishing. Um, and eventually I left the publishing uh, 
house and worked for myself for a while. Mm -hmm. And I was kind of always interested in art galleries and museums and so I liked the kind of idea of bringing the kind of pub, the experience of sort of publishing the, 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 and, and kind of con content publishing and production that I got from the publishing and I was very interested in collections and a kind of digitization which I got from the kind of library period and and so I, and I applied for a number of jobs as a kind of web I guess in those days you'd have called it a webmaster, although that now seems like a very archaic job title. And and I kept applying for these jobs, and I would I would very frequently get an interview, but then I would never get the job. I must have, I, mean, I can't remember how many I applied for, five or six. And what when I kind of followed up and it, it and asked why, you know, why did I why did I not make it through to the final, you know, to successfully get this job? They said, well, you've got all the experience, but you haven't got experience of, you know, w working on very large scale websites using web content management systems. And so I thought to myself, well, I, this is the, I need to get this skill because that's the skill I need to kind of get the job that I really want. So I then, I mean, I applied, I applied for a job at Tate, which was then working in what was called marketing and communications. And it was really overseeing the the kind of listings aspect of the website. And when I came for the job interview, the person interviewing me said, why, why are you applying for this job? Because you're like massively overqualified. And I said, well, because really what I want to do is be running your website and I'll just do this because I need this key skill. So they, so they hired me and I did that for a couple of years. And then the it, it kind of coincided with the the kind of web department moving really, really the organization realizing that there was a kind of step change in the amount the web and and, and the adoption of the web and, and what it could do for the organization and they were going to scale up that team from i think it was probably six people to 12 or so and so they were basically building a new team and they were looking for someone with quite strong editorial background to come come in and hire a new editorial team of people to really take the website through to the next stage. I think the first job was called something like communications, online communications manager or something like that. And then I was web editor, I think. And then I was head of Tate Online. And I'm now head of digital transformation, which should I talk a bit about that? Okay, which is, so the head of digital transformation comes from, we spent, we spent about four or five years, depending on how you count it, and then two very intense years, really tearing apart the website and rebuilding it, because it was 12 years old, and it was, you know, it had kind of a lot of sort of urban sprawl of content, and a broken information architecture, and, you know, it was, it was, from a technology point of view, it was very ar archaic and we were spending a lot of resources on just maintaining it and keeping it as it, as it was. So it was very hard to add new things onto it. And then simultaneously, there'd been this whole uh, kind of shift in the online world, which people at the time were calling Web 2.0, so social media and blogs and user-generated content. And we really weren't in a position to take advantage of those things or kind of respond to that without really taking the whole thing apart and rebuilding it. So we spent a couple of years, so my, my role as head of Tate Online was really doing that. And then what, while we were working on that, there's a sort of shift in the organisation which was suddenly, and this is really in the last couple of years, suddenly there was lots of other departments around the organization suddenly became very interested in digital activity and, and digital started to kind of appear in their departmental strategies and it's uh, new roles started to appear across the organization with a very digital focus some of them even with digital in their job title and some of them just doing a lot more work in that area and so the development of a subsequent digital strategy which in a sense took even, 
evolved from something that was really just what would we do next and a kind of roadmap of things and there is a there is some of that in there but really a kind of recognition that the that the level of maturity of thinking about digital in the organization was about to go through a kind of transition from digital being something that this one department did to digital being something that what we ended up calling the strategy a dimension of everything and that's then matched with and what and what that meant was lots of people in the organization thinking about producing digital content you know articles digitizing new and different areas of our collections um, and you know writing blogs and so on uh, lots of thinking about social media and what the museum as a sort of participatory space would be which moves from so a place which is just a kind of broadcast or, or channel approach where we're just sort of producing content and sending it out into the world to one which is inviting responses to where sort of knowledge and is kind of co-created by the visitor and the museum sort of together. And we're still sort of in very much in that transition. Um, and so what we so the head of digital transformation role is really to respond to that and say, okay, well, how are we going to make digital kind of everywhere in the organization? Because we can kind of imagine some future where digital activity is kind of normalized within the organization's activity and within its structure and the way it thinks about itself and its activities. And so my new role is really to kind of navigate that space because that is a you know, it's a disruption to the entire way that the organisation operates. So we have, in a in a sense, the role is both sort of leading the organisation and trying to sort of help help navigate that space. But it's not being a sort of single person setting the direction for the whole organisation. So sometimes the way I talk about it and I, is that. In a sense, in the in the old model, th there is a. It's more like being a kind of steward for the organisation and a steward for the digital presence, which is distinct from a kind of monarch. And so it's a very and it's very different. And I'm working very closely with the head of organisational development, who sits within the human resources department, and it's a sort of joint project which is a sort of recognition that a lot of it is to do with organisational culture and a lot of it is to do with people and how they work and the skills they have and the confidence they have and then associated kind of guidelines and policies that are not restrictive, so don't try and control people but, uh, but enable them. And, that's, and then technology is, a, is, is part of that but it's not, it's, it's not the fundamental it's not fundamentally not a technology project. I mean, the, the kinds of skills we're looking for are being able to write for the web, which is different from writing a scholarly essay, and it's different from writing an interpretation caption on the wall. But it's quite a well-defined and well-understood skill. There's lots of research about how you should write for the web. It's, there needs to be a kind of broad understanding across the organisation of uh, digital analytics and audience insight and that kind of needs to inform our you know our thinking from the beginning so we're not just think, looking at analytics at the end and wondering what to make of them but we're clearly sitting out um, we're clearly setting out you know digital kind of objectives there is I think we'll end up with many fewer you know digital only jobs so that you know, in, in, there are there are roles in the organisation that have a very digital focus. So you know, digital X or digital Y, and 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 in a sense, in the future, there is no digital marketing manager because all marketing managers are digital marketing managers. So it kind of become that's a you know a signifier that it will become normalised. In several years, you won't need a head of digital transformation. So it is a temporary job. So if you need if you need anyone to like make coffee, <laughs> it's often effective. Um, it's an interesting one because 
when you start to think about what is, is there, okay, when, okay, so this, let's think of a future where digital is sort of enabled and embedded across the organization, and what is the role of a digital department in that? And there needs, to, it would seem, well, we don't quite know, but it would seem that there's, there will need to be some kind of central coordination role that seems important. There, there are clearly certain things that it doesn't make sense for everyone in the organization to, to do, so, I mean, things like, design, uh, computer programming, these are very specialised things that would seem to need to sit in a central department working with everybody. And in the same way that there'll be, but then there'll be sort of specialist digital activity happening across the organisation, which, which the central digital department won't have. So things like email marketing, as, you know, we, we've already transitioned from that being something that happened in my department to that now taking place in in the marketing and communications department and they have a much higher level of specialism in that field than we do. L likewise, when you start to look at digital asset management or born digital archives and, and, and so on, those are specialist skills that exist in those areas. So one of the one of the ways we've sort of articulated it is a in, in the next phase is a kind of hub and spoke model where there's a sort of central Hub department, which is do, which is doing a set of a set of staff and has a set of skills, and then there are spoke departments that have ever greater autonomy. And one of the risks is you can end up with a very uncoordinated and kind of messy. You could return to the way that the old website was, which is very sort of confusing and difficult to navigate. And there's a risk there. The digital thing at Tate is sort of slower at moving into the. What we're not going to see is a kind of huge transformation of suddenly there are going to be screens everywhere because the, the primacy of the, you know, the experience of looking at the art is held in very high regard here. So what we are seeing is, you know, spaces for or digital spaces for the audience to you know, feedback to the museum or kind of write and comment moving from online into the galleries themselves. So the, the Bloomberg Connect screens at Tate Modern are kind of a great example of that your experience of the museum is going to be one of read and write. And it's, and it's perhaps unsurprisingly happening much faster on the website and on social media channels than it is in the actual galleries. Um, but I think it will come there, and then one of the things we're thinking about is, well, what's Tate's particular kind of flavour of doing that? The digital kind of feels like it has to be, un it needs to be not obstructing the art. So if you want it, it should be there, and if you don't want it, it should not be there. And when I go, I normally don't, if I normally go to a museum, I normally don't take the audio guide and don't, don't look at the interactive kiosks, other than for professional interest. Which so, but I will go and read the website and read the things sort of to and from the museum and read the stuff in the cafe. So at the moment, the way that we catalogue digitised collections is primarily and there's lots of interesting work moving, moving on from this, is primarily we're taking the records that we created to manage the collection and we're publishing those online, along with a digital, you know, a, a, a picture or a video or I guess maybe even a 3D scan these days. So we were kind of constantly building a kind of digital knowledge base of the museum that was all, which was very sort of seamless between, you know, looking at the object, pulling up information on your phone, finding out the related things, if they were on display, if they were in other museums, here's the Wikipedia article, here's the scholarly essay, and we don't currently use our collection management systems that way or, you know, manage our content that way in a way that will, it's a, it would be a big undertaking to do this. And then alongside that, there would be ways that the sort of knowledge and thoughts of the visitor could then be sort of written back to the museum 
because you know if you if you knew if you knew about if you knew more about an object or had a personal uh, you know triggered a sort of personal response or, or memory or thought you could write that back and then other people could pick that up and take and take that with them so it it becomes both a sort of knowledge bank of the authority of the museum but it also becomes a kind of repository for the cultural responses of the audience and those two things somehow side by side and sort of growing and sort of feeding off each other and it feels like a lot of our work is sort of heading in that direction um, and, and then it needs and then we also need to think about how does the one museum's collection relate to, to other things in the world, to things outside the museum, things in other museums, to places in the world. I think the museum profession is going to be much more multidisciplinary in the future because in, in, in the sense that the kind of boundaries between, you know, in, in certain, the boundaries between different activities in the museum are starting to sort of blur into each other. So it's sometimes hard to say where does the marketing end and learning begin. Because once we become a kind of, fully become a platform for engagement with audiences, it means that that's not something that's owned by a particular area of the organisation. So it seems like the, the museum professional of the future is someone who understands education and understands research and understands marketing and you know, understands, you know, curatorial practice and, and understands technology. And, and they need to, in a sense, have all of those skills. So, so even though inevitably people will specialise in one area or another, they need to understand all those different things because in the future there is, you know, the success, successful people will be able to do a bit of all of those things. Um, and in a sense, this is one of the things, reasons why the kind of transformation of Tate is more, in a sense, more complicated than it might be at a small museum, because small museums often already operate like that out of necessity due to small budgets and small numbers of staff. And large museums where there's then a much greater specialism in different roles are kind of, there's a, there's a much greater risk that they end up being, activities end up being very siloed or very professionalised and you know, one of the challenges for us is how do we now make that shift? Because we spent a long time working in a particular way that is now getting challenged by, by the kind of digital activity forcing us to come together and, 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 and do, th do things in a different way. And sometimes we end up like bashing into each other a little bit, in a nice way. <laughs> <laughs>